Sloan? Here. Mrs. Johnson? She's amazing here tonight. Mrs. Bays? Here. Ms. Gilliar? Here. Mr. Greenstein? Here. Mr. Kirpin? He won't be here any moment. And Mrs. Weisberg? Here. Thank you. I'll make a motion for the adoption of the agenda, April 17th, 2018. Do I have a second? Mr. Greenstein? How many? Five? Oh, thank you. Uh, we will now have a performance. Do you want to introduce the performance, Mr. Scully? Okay, thank you.
Well, thank you very much. I was playing just like that when I was in fifth grade. Uh, we are now going to have student and community comments. We have a microphone right over there. I just want to remind everyone to please identify yourself for the record, and we will have a three-minute limit. Anyone would like to speak to us now? No, okay. We will have other opportunities to be heard. I now will make my opening statement. I just want to welcome you all here tonight. And uh, we have some important certificates, so I'm going to have those go first before I continue my comments. Mr. Herbin. Thank you very much. You know, You know, in the past, I have been super proud and excited to award certificates in areas of excellence that I myself was involved in, notably math, as a former math teacher and former math, dare I say, whiz. However, tonight, I have the distinct privilege of awarding some certificates in an area that I have absolutely zero competence in. And it's actually even more exciting because I have the utmost respect for those people that have skills that I could never dream of having. And so in fact, today we are recognizing Schreiber High School students that had superior performance in the inaugural season of competitive cheerleading. That's right. Yeah, give it up for the cheerleading squad. Yes. Yes! Dare I say, I'm getting a little of that cheerleader spirit myself. This was the first year the cheerleading team competed at the varsity level in a full schedule of competitions all winter long. They earned the right to compete in the Nassau County Team Championships, finishing sixth in the county and we as a school board couldn't be more proud. Please join me in honoring the following Paul D. Schreiber High School students. When I call your name, please come up. Give it up for Yuka Ama. <laughs> Accepting this honor on Yuka's behalf is me. Anna Domarki. Jordan Donna Donna Wotes. How did I do in the name, Jordan? Where's Jordan? Accepting on Jordan's behalf. Is mom? Come on up, mom, during the filming. How did I do in the name? Donowitz. That was Donowitz. Next up, Gabriel Idlitz. Oh my goodness. I am really on a roll tonight. Of course. Gabriel! Next up, Mia Gab! You can tell we have some cheerleaders in the audience today. Congratulations. And next up, Deborah Gersh! And now it's Derek Hoffman! Um, another name I'm gonna mess up, Ania King! And Yukondo! And Julia McVeigh! And Chloe Miller! Maria Motos! Alexa Nappy! Lily Lacey! 
that came in since the time I began reading? Well, on behalf of the Viking Sports Foundation, we'd like to present this trophy to Natalie and the whole team. You guys did a great job this year. And it's from the McVeigh and the Moshos family and Stephanie Joanne, and we really appreciate it. And you guys did a great job. Kondo here. I did. I did call you Kondo. Gonna photo bomb this one. moment to recognize Stephanie Joannin who oversaw this program from the beginning when a group of students wanted to get involved and do something and compete and find a way to be involved in athletics in a way that they were never able to before and it's thanks to her leadership that this program has become what it has and I would just like all of us to take a moment to thank her for that. And now that the reality TV show portion of our evening is over, <laughs> we will go to the report of the superintendent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I hope that uh, everyone did enjoy the spring break. Um, and we are getting into the home stretch of the end of the school year. And uh, we know it'll be a really, really busy time with sports and concerts and honor society inductions and, of course, uh, moving up ceremonies and graduation. So a lot to come in the next few weeks. Um, just very briefly, uh, as many of you know, we just had the uh, 3 through 8 ELA uh, state assessments. They were administered last Wednesday and Thursday. Um, the, the tests were definitely challenging, and I think the board will have a little further discussion about that uh, later on. Um, I did just want to mention uh, that our opt-out rate for those tests was about 27%, and last year it was about uh, 30%. Uh, the next um, set of assessments is the math, and the math will be administered on May 2nd and May 3rd. Um, just a reminder that uh, there will be a kindergarten orientation sponsored by uh, Parent Council, and that's this coming Monday, April 23rd, at 7 p.m. in the SUSE Auditorium. So we encourage uh, all you know parents new uh, to our school district to to come to that meeting um, and hear from some of our parent leaders 
and uh, some of our principals and teachers just regarding kindergarten. Uh, that is in addition to the individual orientations that occur at each school. <clears throat> I also want to bring um, to your attention uh, some honors that have been bestowed recently on members of our administrative leadership team. We have a really, really uh, strong, effective group of leaders, and um, you know their accomplishments are wide and varied. So last Friday night, um, I know many of you were either aware or participated, uh, the Ed Foundation honored all seven of our building principals uh, at an event at their Sweet 16 party. And uh, it was really a very, very lovely event. It was a well-deserved honor. And so I'd just like to once again congratulate all of our principals um, for that recognition. <laughs> Um, a little earlier this year, our Director of Athletics, Health, and Physical Education, Stephanie Joannin, um, was named by uh, Nassau County Section 8 to the Nassau County High School Athletics Hall of Fame. So we'd like to recognize Stephanie. <laughs> yeah. And uh, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Dr. Uh, Waffle Westervelt, is being honored this Thursday night by LIU Post Phi Delta Kappa Chapter 1524 um, with their Distinguished Service Award for Professionals in Education. So we congratulate <laughs> Dr. Westervelt. <laughs> Uh, I also just learned today that the Port Washington School District um, was named a Best Communities in Music Education for the fourth consecutive year. Yeah. <laughs> <Very proud of> <laughs> And just give me a second, because I generally don't do this from my phone. <laughs> I have a couple of sports um, reports, uh, just to make everyone aware that the 100th Port Washington Invitational Track Meet is this Saturday um, here in Port Washington. This is the oldest track meet in uh, the country, and we will have 18 teams from the city and Suffolk County coming in as participants. So hopefully the weather will cooperate on Saturday. Um, and then the following weekend on April 28th, the baseball team is hosting its sixth year of Coaches versus Cancer on the new turf um, baseball field. And the eighth grade Weber team, the JV and the varsity will have games on that day. So just uh, be aware of all that. Um, I will let Ms. Fennick give us an enrollment and kindergarten enrollment update. Thank you, Dr. Mooney. Um, as of April 11th, we have 5,555 students. Uh, five more students than we had at the same time as last year, this time last year. And the kindergarten um, enrollment, as of April 16th, we have a total of 354 um, students registered. Our projected enrollment is 417, so we're moving along quite slowly, which is fine. <laughs> I will now make a motion for the approval of minutes as follows, March 19th, 2018, March 27th, 2018. I have a second, Mr. Kirpin, all in favor? 6-0, thank you. And we will now go to the discussion item, budget. Okay, so uh, we are at the moment of truth um, for the 2018-2019 school year budget. So uh, the administration would like to present uh, our final recommendation uh, for the budget. There, are, there is a little bit of new information uh, to, just to review because we did get our final state aid numbers uh, right before or right during the, um, the spring break. So I will let Ms. Callahan uh, go through where we are and if the board has any uh, questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of anybody who has not been 
including this evening, four uh, budget and facilities meetings, and four evening board meetings, specifically where budget has been the topic. Uh, we began by talking about our fund balance, our fiscal stress, where our revenues would be, and um, the dates that I've noted on this one recap sheet begin with March 13th, but our meetings began in January. And the numbers really did not change very much all along in the process. Uh, but I must say that of our $4.7 million budget increase, $3 million of that is related to pensions, health insurance, and debt service. And only 1.7 is related to the rest of the entire budget. We are definitely a human resources rich organization. We have over, well, close to a thousand people on our payroll during the full school year. And so uh, we have to expect that a good portion of our budget is going to be related to salary and benefits. Um, I think that we also need to realize that with the tax cap as it's been established, the formula through the state, that the levy does not fund the budget fully. And through our discussions with the board, we have been able to determine thus far that we will be taking money from our unassigned fund balance, from our retirement reserve, and from our debt service fund to help bridge the gap between what the levy allows for and what the budget really needs. So as of this evening, with an additional $300,000 in aid that we were notified of over the spring break, we had previously in January been notified of a $300,000 increase. So in total, the state will be providing us with about $600,000 more than last year. That has helped a great deal. Uh, when we look at the staffing, we started out with a larger number of staff being requested. And over the last several meetings, uh, Dr. Mooney has put those in a, a priority order based on the funds that we have available. And I will let her explain to you more about the specific uh, positions. But we have at this point determined that we have $700,000 in funds against what had originally been an $881,000 request. Uh, once Dr. Mooney talks to you about the particular positions, We'll talk to you where that additional $181,000 hopefully will come from. Dr. Mooney. Thank you, Ms. Callahan. Uh, so this, is, um, this has not been a change from the staffing positions that we've been talking about all along. So uh, since there is funding, uh, we, will be, we are including uh, a special education teacher, point eight for Salem. Uh, an elementary teacher position at Weber, uh, a bilingual kindergarten teacher position, something that uh, we must make accommodation for even if uh, it doesn't come to be realized. Because of the increase in students at Weber due to the large cohort coming from fifth grade, we do need some additional world language teacher support, and that will come in the equivalent of a 0.4 position. And uh, again, based on student enrollment at Schreiber, the priority position at this time is the math teacher. Um, so those are the um, instructional positions based on what we can uh, accommodate in the current 2018-19 proposed budget. We are also looking to uh, include uh, the literacy administrator for grades three through six. 
So the additional state aid funding partially was applied uh, for this um, position, the, the administrator position. So as Dr. Mooney indicated, we have $601,000 in priority staffing. The board has afforded us the opportunity through the use of state aid and fund balance to be providing actually $700,000. So where would the $98,000 go? You would think it would automatically go to another position. However, in the very beginning of the budget process, based on realistic expectations in prior years, we had anticipated at least five teacher retirements with a savings of $50,000 for each retirement. As of today, I don't know if we're, we're still at two retirements. So we've shorted ourselves <laughs> $150,000 in the budget process. So that $98,000 is going to be put toward the 150, and then if, as Ms. Fennick indicated, if kindergarten enrollment does not materialize to the extent we expect, that may be another position that won't be needed for kindergarten. So we can put that money back into the pool. And if bilingual does not come to B, because that requires meetings with individual parents coming into the district to determine if they want to be in a bilingual program, if a certain number does affirm that that's what they wish, we're required to run the program. If that number doesn't materialize, then the money that we had set aside for bilingual, bilingual will be used to fund these other positions, which at the moment are sitting off to the side, but we are not asking the board to fund the $279,000 required for the health PE teacher, the grounds position, or the social studies teacher. Is that correct, Dr. Mooney? Would I be saying that accurately? Yes, just to be just to make it clear that we don't have enough funds to cover all the new staffing requests that we have been talking about. However, should uh, some of those funds become available uh, either through additional um, teacher retirements that even, even if we exceed the five, or um, again, we don't realize all the kindergarten sections we're expecting and or the bilingual position does not materialize, we want it to be very transparent to the community that then we would then seek to uh, apply those funds to um, to the positions that we could not previously fill. So that could potentially happen between now and the actual budget vote or after the budget vote. Um, these funds, this was discussed at the last budget meeting. So the positions that you see, the health PE teacher, facilities, grounds, and social studies teacher, that is a priority order. So for example, if only enough funds comes to us for one position, the first position to be filled would be the health phys ed. With additional funds, we would go to the facilities grounds position, which is not as high as a teacher position, and the social studies position then would be the third position if, again, funds become available. So we're not looking to confuse the issue. We want to be clear that the three positions at the bottom are currently not included in the budget. Yes, and while the budget vote itself is May 15th, it's a whole month away, there is a state requirement that the board adopt a budget by this Friday. That's what they would say is the very last legal date. So we have chosen to bring it to the board at their usually scheduled meeting for a vote this evening. And I'm happy to take any questions. 
Um, I don't have any questions at this time, but I did just want to uh, thank the administration, and particularly you, Mary, and your office for all the work that you put in in helping us to get all the numbers together for this budget. Uh, I just want to take a moment to publicly thank for the tireless efforts on our behalf on, on getting more state aid, and they continue to try and work and get us more money in other areas, but Senator Phillips and Assemblyman Durso, because they uh, played a big role in the money that we have received thus far, and I just spoke with Senator Phillips' office today, and they are continuing to try and find other funding for us. So uh, it's important that everyone know the work they did on our behalf in Port Washington. And I just, oh, yes, of course. I must thank the community for all of their efforts in coming forward with the work of the Legislative Task Force, getting it out to all of you, and all of the letters that were sent to the legislators, and all of those efforts obviously helped pay off to us, and it, it's significant and, and very helpful. It's not enough, and we keep working, but it, it's really, it, was, it, was, it made a difference this year. I'm very happy that we stuck to what we said we we're going to do last year. We took significantly less money out of our reserves this year than last, and yet we are still able to bring in a budget that is including a lot of new hires and sticking to a long-term plan that Dr. Mooney had brought to us. We will be hiring another administrator to continue towards the plan with literacy. There, a lot of wonderful things are going on in this budget, and I, I'm really proud of it. I plan to support it tonight. And I just want to speak for Nora Johnson, who couldn't be here tonight. It was important to her for everyone to know that she, too, supports this budget. Thank the budget committee, led by Beth Weisberg, for all the work. This starts, you know, pretty much after the budget vote. We start on next year's budget. So a lot of work has gone into this. And uh, I'm, I'm, I am proud of what we're putting forth tonight. So I hope the community will be supportive of it as well. And is there anyone else? Larry? Yeah, uh, I'd just like to follow up on what Karen said. Um, the reason we got this extra $300,000 is that both our assembly member and our senator were able to go to their conference leader with a stack of letters and go, this, I'm getting beaten up here, you guys gotta help out Port Washington. And as far as I understand, we were the largest uh, increase um, in, the, um, in our assembly district. So we were one of the larger increases in Nassau County. And it's, not, it's because we had the need, but because you were all active and helped us prove to them that we had the need that we were able to do this and it, it really, uh, grassroots efforts like this really do work. And we just, we just took step one and we're gonna keep asking you to help us again. But thank you all for your help. And I'm you know, very happy that the budget ended up where it did and I'm happy it ended up here with so little angst. And hopefully we'll have some more retirements and be able to fund a few of more of these positions and uh, move forward, so thank you. Larry stole my thunder, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, but I do also want to thank the community for being very active. We did take a road show out and we asked a lot of you to write letters and I do want to say thank you to everyone. We will be thanking everyone formally as soon as we get Carl Huth to do a presentation again. But um, I do want to say thank you. I do want to thank our senator and our assemblyman for fighting for us. I do want to thank Beth for working hard and Mary Callahan for working hard. I do plan on supporting tonight's budget as well. Um, we do have a long way to go, but I think we're on a, the right track. Uh, I know this is like a, a happy parade here, but I, I also need to reiterate, you know, it's my job to sit with Mary and sit with Kathy and sit with Karen and, and say, can we find a little more here? And can we do a little more here? And they then go back and, and so, Additionally, aside from thanking the two of them, I also want to thank our building leaders, our directors. Every person in this district came together to make a, a forward-moving budget happen for the students of our district, and, and that, that is a tremendous amount of work, and it's a tremendous amount of time and effort and energy and a huge commitment to the kids, and so I just wanted to reiterate that, that um, I really appreciate it. I know it, it was not easy, but you guys, every, everyone came together, everyone accomplished what we needed to accomplish and it's um, we're in a good place right now so thank you for that thank you. 
I simply wanted to say the, the budget document is done, but the vote has not taken place yet. Please remember, it's May 15th, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. <laughs> and if you are not sure if you are registered, we have something on our website now. If you go to budget on the far left side, you will see at the bottom of the page a place to click. You can put in your name. You can see if you voted last year or not, or uh, at least if you're registered through the Board of Elections. So you won't have any problem the day of the vote. You all, I think, know that we have one voting location. We have had only one voting location for at least four years now. It's right next door at the Weber All-Purpose Room. Uh, tell your friends and family to please come out and vote, but only vote once and in one location. Thank you. We'll now go to committee reports, policy and personnel. Emily, can cover that? Policy and personnel. Okay, we met on, our last meeting took place on the 11th of this month. We discussed at length our Facebook page. Uh, the conversation pretty much took up our, our entire meeting. Uh, we will be meeting, our next meeting is on May 3rd at 8.30, where we will be discussing the public use of facilities. And roster fees. <laughs> Budget and facilities, is there anything else, Beth? Uh, nothing to add from the previous. Our next meeting is April 24th, and we'll be discussing a sponsorship opportunity um, through facilities. So that would be April 24th, 8.30 in the morning at the Daily Annex. Curriculum. Fire. Um, we have not met since the last meeting, and I'm just waiting for my calendar to pop up to remember when our next meeting is. April 27th is our next meeting, and it will be at the Delhi Annex at 8.30. So it is Science Curriculum K-12, right? Thank you. I will now move the action items A1 through D9B, pulling A2 and A5. Do I have a second? Mr. Kirpin. All in favor? 5 0. Oh, thank you very much. And now I will go to A2 and make a motion that Mrs. Callahan will fill in the blanks. Yes. Well, basically, A2 is the BOCES uh, administrative budget for $21,962,652 and the election of potentially three board members, Susan Bergstrom, Martin Kay, and Michael Winnick. The way this works, I will call each of the board member names. Everybody has to raise their hand or lower. I have to have a majority, and then they are entitled to one vote from the Port Washington board. So uh, if we could do the, the, the board members and then do the budget. Susan Bertram. Okay. Martin Kay. Michael Winnick. Great. And the budget vote. All in favor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Six zero. And then for number five, I have to put in. This is the school district budget which is $155,938,460. Okay, I'm gonna, do I have to officially call that to question? Yes. Okay, so I'm doing that, calling it a question. Do I have a second? No, I have to make a motion. Do I have a second? Ms. Weisberg, is budget chair, do you second? Aye. Call to question, all in favor? Six out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we're on board policy. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm not really following everything as well as usual this evening. I do not have donations. But I would like to recognize that we have appointed two new administrators for our school district this evening. And um, 
I very much have the thought now that when one door closes, another opens because two senior administrators are leaving our district, but two new wonderful administrators are entering our district. So I would just like to welcome Dr. Stephanie Allen as the Executive Director of Pupil Personnel Services. And I'd like to welcome Mr. Andrew Akavanidis. <laughs> I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it by the time you're here in September. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome. I just want to take one second to thank, as you know, it's a very intensive, rigorous process that our candidates must go through, but the process could not happen without the volunteer support of an administrative committee, a teacher committee, and a parent committee. And their uh, participation and voices in this process is just so very integral uh, to everything that we do. Um, we're really excited. Dr. Allen is already an administrator in our school district, and we're just very pleased for this promotion for her. Um, and Mr. Akapinas is uh, new to us, and we're very excited about um, his role, new role as well. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, as I said, you know, we have a fantastic leadership team, and I know that they'll just be uh, wonderful additions. And ultimately, it's our students who are the beneficiaries of um, this strong leadership. And uh, so, and, and soon we'll be having new teacher hires and other new hires as well. But um, for tonight, we're just really pleased. So congratulations, welcome to our school district. I will now go to board policy and approve for the first reading with the recommendation of the superintendent, policy 5405 wellness. Is there any old business? Under new business, first of all, I would like to make, get ready, Mr. Kirpin, the exciting news that we will, in fact, be launching a Facebook page for the district. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, details on that will be forthcoming very shortly. Second, we would like to have a uh, discussion tonight about I guess stepping up to make a, a formal statement about the testing and the board and superintendent's concerns about the benefits of the testing that we've encountered, the lack of benefits to the students in the past week and in going forward. And before we embark on that conversation, I think it uh, is worthy to remind the community that as members of the Board of Education and a superintendent of schools, we swear on an oath when we come into office to uphold the laws of the State Education Department. As such, there are certain limits to what we can say or do, regardless of how we might personally feel about it. And we hope that members of the community can understand and respect that, that we can't pick and choose which laws to follow. We really believe that we need to follow them all. That being said, it doesn't mean we can't voice our concerns and disapproval of a lot of the things that are going on in state education today, including the testing. So uh, I believe, I, I don't know, you, okay. Mr. Greenfield, would you like to open the conversation? Um, okay. Um, it appears that although State Education Department for the past three years has promised that, um, oh, these are just little problems, they'll be better, they'll be better, oh, we have a new vendor, they'll be better, they get worse every year, and their credibility, which for me started out at about zero, is now um, minus whatever. And so I do think that we have an obligation to uh, voice our displeasure, and I would go so far as to say perhaps we should uh, ask for the resignation of the person who keeps lying to us and telling us it's going to get better, um, that, that being the, the um, State Commissioner of Education. But I am not, I'm not sure that my fellow board members will agree. Uh, I do agree that we have to 
follow the law, but I also agree that we have to do what's best for the children and, to, and the, the lives of the children that, uh, supersede the law in some ways. And when a law is unjust and harmful, we have an obligation to um, oppose it in whatever ways are going to be most productive. So the way the, we have very, very limited tools as a Board of Education, but certainly voicing our concern and alerting the public to, the, to our concerns and just the way we were able to get a lot of state aid. If our public is upset with the way things are going and want things to be different, they can, they can help us in this cause also. And we have, a, you know, what we know is that when the community gets riled up, the community gets action. So anyway, I'm glad that we're having this discussion and I hope we can come up with something and I'm happy to help in any way I can. So from what I, the way I understood it in our discussions is that the testing, this particular round of testing that just took place this past week, the second day of was, took longer, the students took longer to finish their testing than anticipated and that was because the state determined to eliminate the third day, but instead of actually taking material and eliminating it, they kind of condensed it into the second day. And that probably did create an extra stress for our students. So I think as a board, as Karen said, we can't not discuss, you know, we have to follow the law, but I think it is important for us to tell the state that we were disappointed in the way that they've implemented the testing or made the changes that they made did not really meet the, what they promised is not what, what winds up happening. Um, I do know that there, uh, uh, Dr. Westfield actually told me that the Nassau Association for the Development of Curriculum Officials, which she is president of, will be composing a letter to such this degree, basically to, to the state, right? So I think that there's definitely, uh, educators are upset about it as well, and I think that it's important that they speak uh, but it is important that we as well make a statement that we are unhappy. That's my statement. Um, I, I have to say, so we had a, you know, we have conversations and curriculum conversations and assessment conversations. And my understanding of the purpose for its assessment is to be able to inform instruction, to improve our curriculum, to improve our te teaching practices. Um, unfortunately, we've heard time and again, and, and more specifically this year, that the inappropriateness of the questions on the test and the inappropriateness of the testing in general and the time consumption is not going to yield a set of data that is going to allow us to really dig deep and, and help improve. And therefore, our instructional time for our students, our resources, both financial and time for our teachers, are very, very precious. This time is short, and we need to let State Ed know that that this is not um, this is not acceptable to us that to continue to take away the opportunity um, to improve. Um, a good assessment would give us that opportunity, and it's not unreasonable for us to expect um, nothing but the best from them, and we are not getting that. And so I believe it's time that we step up as a board and let them know that we demand better for our students, we demand better for our school districts, we demand better for our teachers, and we, we have to, you know, if we, if we don't voice that opinion, uh, I'm not sure that we, you know, it's like if you don't vote, you can't complain. We need to vote. We need to vote with our voices, and I believe we're going to do that. Um, I'm completely on board with what everybody else has said. Um, I think that we have a very powerful um, community movement that's been raising awareness about the problems with the testing for years now, and we should all be grateful to them, to them for educating all of us. Um, but I think that our role and their role are distinctly different, and I think the opt-out movement um, is in some ways, I guess for lack of a better term, is a vigilante movement, and I mean that in a very positive way, actually. Um, so they are encouraging students to not take the test as a way of protest, because that's what you can do when you're outside the system. But as part of the districts that are subject to these laws and the Board of Ed that has to uphold them, 
I think that we should speak out and hold the state accountable for what they've done here to absolutely the limit of what we think we're, we are legally allowed to do. Obviously, nobody wants to jeopardize any funding or anything for our community, but I don't think it is at risk for us to say to them, you, you, if you are going to test our children, you need to be testing them with purpose. You need to have these tests be giving us data or information that is useful for having the children learn more, useful for evaluating our teachers. Because right now what's happening is we're taking away classroom time for the testing itself. We're taking away classroom time for teachers um, to do prep for the test. And in addition to that, I think it's important to note because this part really troubles me. I think part of the amazing part of that education is the magic that happens in an individual classroom when you have a gifted teacher teaching a class and putting their own individual spirit into that classroom and this testing regime gets rid of and eliminates the ability for teachers to do that as much and that really troubles me so i'm very heartened that we are basically in agreement that something needs to be done and now we can figure out exactly what the right statement is for us to make the state to say to say to the state enough is enough you told us that it's going to get better and it's not it's getting worse and it's serving no purpose and it's actually doing um, an injustice to our children and also to our teachers uh, i just i just the only thing i wanted to add for the board in consideration of what you would be um, telling to the state. I think some of the things that we are looking for are um, assessments that are developmentally appropriate for students, assessments that align to what students are learning in the classroom. We have such a rich uh, instructional program, and oftentimes the, uh, the assessments don't reflect what the students are actually learning, therefore, uh, they don't become uh, as valid a measure of student growth. And so I think that's where a lot of the flaws tend to be in all of this, and to create a, a frustrating situation for students and teachers doesn't, isn't productive for anybody. So just to you know, kind of give a little guidance as to uh, the kinds of things. I think it's always important. It's one thing to express dissatisfaction and frustration. It's another to offer um, productive ideas for positive change. And it is frustrating to all of us that we were promised positive change. And unfortunately, that's not what was experienced with this latest um, go around with the assessments. Uh, to that end about uh, positive suggestions, so to speak, one of the things that's always remarkable to me is that I really believe we have some of the best educators and finest educators here in Fort Washington that you can find anywhere. And in many other districts, I'm sure they feel the same way. And yet these educators really don't seem to be consulted, and certainly not in a meaningful way, anything more than lip service on what these assessments should look like, what could be of value to a school district. And I think that state ed has to start listening to the people that are working in the districts with the children. And along those lines, I just want to add that there were some things you know, that we've heard, some feedback anecdotally, but nonetheless, for the record, I would like to comment that we understand some parents in hearing children come home and being very upset, feeling the children weren't prepared for the tests and that they were very upset and anxious because they didn't know the tests and feeling that the teachers were to blame for this because the teachers hadn't really taught to the tests appropriately. And it's important to know that our teachers are in no way to blame for this. The tests were not developed appropriately for the children. They just were not going to know the material. And I, don't, I hate to think about anyone blaming any of the educators in our school district for that because it's just not so. And the other thing is that we have spent time as a board talking about the tests in the past. 
and to whatever end we are able to, we have written letters in the past, and the superintendent has been involved in her organizations and associations writing letters in the past, and we'll keep trying to do that, but I just don't want anyone to think that we haven't had any level of concern about this for many years. Larry? Yeah, I would just like to follow up if I could, if we could, um, if Dr. Mooney and her um, team could give us some bullet points about the testing and then perhaps uh, um, uh, Karen and Norris, if she's not here and can't say no, uh, can, cra uh, can craft something to pass by us and we can, uh, we can get this going. We sort of need, we need, we need, we need a strategy to move forward. So I just wanted to suggest that. Uh, I was actually, because Nora isn't here, I don't want to drag her into this. So I actually, it's very difficult with seven people to write one letter. And we've had experiences with this in the past, and it takes a really long time. And we'd like to get this going faster. So uh, we've had some success in the past when Beth and I have worked on it together. And then we will share it with everybody else on the board and get comments and try and move as quickly as possible on this. And of course, work with Dr. Mooney before we complete it. OK, thank you. Uh, I will now go to another opportunity for the community to be heard. If anyone wants to speak to us again, I ask that you identify yourself for the record and remind you that there's a three minute limit. Deborah Brooks, um, some of what I am going to say you've already covered, but I wrote this in anticipation of being able to speak at the beginning of community comment. Um, I will say that I'm very distressed for our district to hear that parents were actually complaining to the district that the teachers had not properly prepared the children for the tests. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it's testament to the fact that the parents really do not understand what is in these tests and what is going on with the testing situation and anybody who wants to speak to me about that, I'm happy to tell them our, our teachers are amazing, they work really hard, and neither the scores nor what our children experienced last week are a reflection on our teachers. I've been fighting in support of public education and against the Common Core State standardized test for over five years. My only child is an eighth grader at Weber. She sat for her first and only set of federally mandated state tests in third grade and has since opted out five years straight. As a result of my advocacy, I'm privy year after year to stories of testing abuse throughout New York State. Last week's ELA test, however, reached a new level of abuse for our public school kids. We all know the tests neg negatively impact our most vulnerable kids, those special ed and ELLs. This year, however, no district and no child was immune. State ed and testing giants Questar and Pearson, yes, Pearson is still in the picture, outdid themselves as even high-functioning kids statewide spent all day on these untimed tests were upset and frustrated by confusing, nonsensical, and ambiguous test content and even dissolved into tears over these tests. Parents, teachers, and administrators statewide continue to post distressing first-hand stories on social media. The ELA was an inexcusable educational disgrace. I understand from other parents the kids here in Port cried over these tests. The Port kids were sent to the nurse's office with writer's cramps so bad they sought a medical note to excuse them from the rest of the test, and that gen ed Port kids spent hours upon hours on these tests, some even all day. I hope that people here understand that this is unsound pedagogy, unproductive, unnecessary, and just plain wrong, dare I say abusive, and I hope the district will investigate. Our community needs to understand how the state tests negatively impact our children last week. One way to fight this testing monster, and I know that the administrators can't say it, but I can, is to refuse the state tests. I invite anyone interested in knowing more about them to join the Port Washington Advocates for Public Education Facebook page or speak to me privately. Uh, Garden City had 40% opt-out, Great Neck had 17%, Harrods had 12, Jericho had 19, Three Locust minutes. Valley 61, Manhasset 17, North Shore 37, Rockville Center 59, Roslyn 27. Three minutes. We are not alone in this. Thank you. Is there anyone else for community comments this evening?
Nanette Milconian, I can't resist. Thank you for the conversation. It's very exciting. Um, we, some school districts are being proactive and sending out letters in the beginning of the school year informing parents of their right to opt out. I think it would be a wonderful conversation for the board to have. Um, parents need to know what their rights are. They need to know that it's, it's legal and it gives us our classrooms back. Um, thank you so much for having this conversation. Okay, well, that will be the end of community comments. And before I adjourn, I just would like to mention that our next meeting is May 1st, which is a budget hearing and the um, annual tenure reception, which will be in the auditorium. Yes, yes. okay. Uh, thank you very much and have a good night.